so good to be joined in the sanctuary by you, Mr. Porter and Haley and Foster and Liz and Ella come. I'm so grateful for all of your gifts this morning. Will you all pray with me? Oh God, we know that you live. And so we too will live. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Oh God, our rock and our redeemer. There's a piece of artwork in my dining room. Like many people over the course of this pandemic, Noah and I have tried to do a little decorating of our walls as we got tired of looking at the same thing every day. And so we have this, this new framed piece of artwork. It's a print, it's pretty simple. It depicts a flower on a black background green stem, green leaves, red petals, little spot of yellow in the middle. We purchased it from the Bread and Puppet Theater Company when we were in Vermont for our little wedding ceremony over the summer. So it has good memories attached to it. And because of where I sit when I eat my breakfast, I look at it every morning. And I take in the image and the words that are written across the top. It says, resistance of the heart against business as usual. It's become something of my mantra since I purchased it, resistance of the heart against business as usual. It's my little way of reminding myself to push back against this collective myth that I feel like we're sort of being told to live in, this idea that we should somehow be able to absorb near constant tragedy that we should just routinize it into our daily lives, that we shouldn't feel upset or unable to keep going when we open the newspaper and see what is on it, that we should just be able to continue to be the best employee, best friend, parent, student, teacher that we can. I can't tell you the number of people who have told me recently that they feel like they're failing. Who say to me, I'm not being productive enough right now. Or I'm so tired all the time, but I feel like I just can't take a break. Or I'm sad. I'm just sad. And these people who have told this to me really feel guilty for all of those feelings. But to my ears, that's nothing to be guilty about. That's not reflection of failure. Those are reflections of the truth that it can't be business as usual during a pandemic. It just can't. It can't be business as usual when there are two major mass shootings in less than a week. It can't be business as usual when members of our community don't feel safe going outside. Business as usual isn't possible. And more than that, business as usual isn't right. Not when it means ignoring our humanity or the common good or the voice of God. Lest you think I have it all figured out though, I forgot my own mantra on Tuesday, just this Tuesday. I was sitting in the upstairs office, just 
staring at my computer and I was finding it almost impossible to work. Tuesday, is, of course, was the day that many of us learned about the most recent shooting in Colorado. I was finding it really hard to concentrate, but I dragged myself through the day. Even though I was quite frankly overcome with grief and anger, I was so angry. My mind was telling me to keep pushing, but my body and my spirit had a different message. My mind was saying, Sarah, business as usual, business as usual, but my spirit was saying, Hosanna. Hosanna, Jesus, save us. Hosanna, it's such a fitting word for these times. I don't know about you, but I found myself more connected to our traditional stories this year, whether it's the story of Advent and, and preparing the way or during Lent, the story of wilderness, I feel so connected to it. And Hosanna feels right to me. And luckily for me as the preacher this morning, it's also the word that branches our texts, reaching from the Psalm to the gospel to this very moment we're all in. Psalm 118 verses 25 through 26 and the original Hebrew reads, Ana Adonai Hoshiana, Ana Adonai Hatlichana, Baruch Habab Bashem Adonai. That means save us, save us. We beseech you, O Lord. Oh, Lord, we beseech you. Give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Those are the very words that the crowd yells as Jesus rides into the city of Jerusalem. The crowd is quoting Psalm 118, quoting the words of their tradition as they call out to Jesus in celebration and call out to Jesus for salvation. Which I think brings us to the question, from what do they need to be saved? People don't cry out for no reason. People do not lay down their cloaks and wave branches in the air and follow a man on a donkey without cause. The people need salvation from business as usual. The people who are following Jesus in this moment, the people who have followed him throughout his ministry are the ones oppressed by the business of empire. They are the poor, the disenfranchised, the outcast, the sinners, the sick, the troubled, wealthy, the ones whose souls are disquieted within them. And Jesus's entry gives them hope. It's a profound statement of leadership. Help has arrived. And make no mistake, this isn't just a spiritual moment. It's a political statement. Foster previewed this for us several weeks ago in his sermon, referencing the work of Reverend Dr. Aubrey Hendricks. Palm Sunday is a political moment not necessarily in the contemporary sense, but in the sense that the personal is political, in the sense that Jesus is saying something here about systems, the systems of wealth that existed at the time, the systems of distribution, the systems of violent control, the systems that wouldn't let people have a voice. And I think we should hear some resonance to what's happening right now. And Jesus planned this to be political. It wasn't an accident. His actions deliberately signal a specific form of leadership, a reversal of the systems of power that existed at the time. His entry into the city, it starts at the Mount of Olives. Now this mountain held deep significance for the people of Jerusalem. 
King David left Jerusalem in defeat by way of the Mount of Olives. And the prophet Zechariah identified the Mount as the location for the Lord's return. So Jesus is thinking strategically. He chooses a prophetic route into the city. And he rides in upon a donkey. Again, that's not an accident. That's an intentional choice. Jesus sets this up, right? He asks two disciples to go into the village, telling them what to say to the donkey's owner, specifying that it needs to be a colt that has never been ridden before. And a donkey, it was a common animal, a humble animal. But furthermore, one used for travel by those who were coming in peace. Jesus enters Jerusalem not on a horse, like a military general, nor by foot, like a religious pilgrim, but on a donkey as a humble, peaceful leader. Jesus communicates a great deal on this day without saying a single word. It's a culminating moment, Palm Sunday. The triumphal entry is a depiction of everything Jesus has said in his ministry. Love your neighbor as yourself, meaning there should not be inequality because you should want your neighbor to have what you have. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Meaning, let God's kingdom overturn the current kingdom. The spirit of the Lord is upon me to bring good news to, to who? To the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free. Those aren't platitudes. Those aren't actionless thoughts and prayers. Those are the words of someone who has come literally to change the world now, to literally reverse business as usual. No wonder the people shouted Hosanna. No wonder the same praise rises to our lips this morning because we too need salvation centuries later. I used to think that salvation was sort of a one and done thing, that you got saved and that was that, you're, you're good. But I think that Palm Sunday and Psalm 118 teach us something a little different and ultimately in my opinion, so much more hopeful. Psalm 118 is a liturgy. It was used for procession into the temple for worship. And we use it as pieces of liturgy regularly. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. That's the call to worship right there. That comes from this psalm. And the psalm praises God for God's hesed. I know I've got a lot of Hebrew for you all this morning. Hesed, that means God's loving kindness. God's steadfast love. In fact, that phrase, steadfast love, is repeated five times throughout the psalm. It's a refrain. And the liturgy moves from celebrating God's steadfast love in the now to remembering God's steadfast love in the past to calling on God's steadfast love in the future. We didn't hear all of the psalm this morning. There's a middle section. And that middle section recounts the great adversity that the community had faced. I'm summarizing a little here, but it says, out of my distress, I called on the Lord. And the Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. 
All nations surrounded me. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. They surrounded me like bees, like blazing a fire of thorns. I was pushed hard so that I was falling. I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. Any one of us might have written those words this year. How many of us felt in distress or felt like we were, pa- were falling or felt like we were being pushed and pushed and pushed? The psalm, it doesn't ignore the suffering. It names the intense suffering of the community. It tells what they have been through and it tells that God's love has been with them and has saved them. The psalmist is essentially saying, the Lord saved us. The Lord delivered us through the desert. And guess what, my friends, we'll need to be saved again. The psalmist is saying to the people, hard times, they're going to come again. And we can trust God to do it again. We trust that God's steadfast love will endure forever. Hosanna, save us now, cry the people of the psalm. Hosanna, save us now, cry the people of Jerusalem. Hosanna, save us now, cry the people of Hyde Park Union Church the people of Chicago, the people of the world in this year of the unimaginable. We cry out in distress. We cry out in grief, yes. And we also cry out Hosanna in faith that God will be God. We cry out in the assurance that God will save us. Do you know what assurance feels like? Have you ever felt assured of something? Maybe it was the love of a family member or a friend. Maybe it was your own sense of self. Have you felt assured? We can know with assurance that God will be God now and forever. Of course, the irony of Palm Sunday is that this crowd of Hosanna, in this very crowd, there are those who will betray, deny, and even cheer the death of Jesus. The irony is that even though Jesus has made his message so clear, has preached it again and again and again, has told his disciples the inevitable conclusion, they still do not understand. It's hard to understand when you're blinded by business as usual. When you've been told that it has to be this way. When you are trained in the ways of the empire. My friends, this morning we stand on the precipice of Holy Week. We stand in the assurance of Hosanna and in the knowledge that we too have moments where we forget or we fail to understand. So let each Hosanna be an opportunity this morning to come home to the resistance, to come home to the enduring love of God, to come home to the radical message of Jesus, the knowledge that it does not have to be this way, and the assurance, the assurance that it will not stay this way. Hosanna, come home to the one who took human form, and rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, reminding everyone who saw him 
that we can no longer have business as usual. Amen.